Hey guys, I'm Jeremy and I'm coming to you from Erie, Pennsylvania, where one of the most bizarre true crime stories ever happened. So it was behind here at Mamma Mia's Pizza that they had gotten a call for an order for a couple pizzas. And it was down at basically the end of an abandoned road where there was an old TV tower. And it was there where the pizza delivery guy, this guy, Brian Wells, who was 46 years old, they actually put a bomb collar around him. It was kind of looks like a handcuff, but it had a couple of pipe bombs and other things on there. And he got a bunch of papers, which were ransom basically. And he was supposed to go through all of these different tasks and then he would be free of this bomb collar. And so his first task was to go to a bank and rob it for $250,000. And then he was supposed to go to a McDonald's to get his next clue and then continue from there. And of course the police came, not surprisingly, and he ended up running out of time and it was beeping faster and faster and it actually exploded and killed him. So it was one of the most complicated and unusual cases the FBI ever looked into. And so there's several different people involved in this case, mainly two or three, but a few others. And so basically I'll go into uh, what happened in this case, try to give you a brief overview. It's really quite complicated. I could go on for hours, but I'll give you kind of the brief idea and I'll stop at some of the locations of this case. So actually the Mamma Mia is here. Uh, it's not the original one. It was down on Peach Street where most of these things happened. I think the original one got burned down uh, a few years ago. And so I'll head over to the other locations now. And so now I'm over at the McDonald's, which was actually his first stop after he went to the bank. So the actual bank, which is the PNC bank, was just right nearby in this plaza over here, it's since gone. There's several other locations in town, but that location's gone now. And so that was their first bad idea, is to have them come so close, because even though they're not supposed to call the police, even if the bank didn't, someone maybe inside would have called, and so he would have walked out, just drove like two minutes. And then next to this drive-through here is where they have this rock, and underneath that was his instructions for his next move, but this is a little town and this is a big main road, which is Peach Street. So the cops probably were here within a few minutes. And so I'm not sure if he took this back road or if he was out front, but they got him in Eyeglass World, which is the building directly next door. So I'll go over there now. And basically what happened was, you know, they arrested him and handcuffed him and they were asking him what happened. And he said, you know, I'm a hostage. I went down to the end of the road and he lied and he made up a thing and he said there were three black guys that had robbed him and put this collar on his neck and he's got this whole scavenger hunt. They weren't sure what to do, but they could tell that there was definitely something around his neck. Um, when the people had put that around his neck, they also put this big guest t-shirt on. So it was actually kind of covered at the beginning, but you could tell there's something bulging out. And once they knew there was a bomb, they were like, yeah, we don't know if this is real or not, but I don't want to get near you. And so he's down on the ground, in the cop car for a bit and then they were waiting for the bomb squad to come. But they had actually already closed off the roads around here. And so the bomb squad took longer than it usually would. And he only had 55 minutes from when it was placed on him. So from wherever he was, was probably, I don't know, 15 minutes here, 15 minutes in the bank. And then like, you know, 15 minutes there, you can see it's already 45 minutes at that point. And so, yeah, he was only there 10 or 15 minutes and it started beeping faster and faster and it blew up and actually, opened up like his chest like a fist size hole in his chest you can actually find it online um yeah pretty gruesome and sad and you know at that time they're they're like they had no idea what happened this guy you know robbed this bank and they had no idea who else was involved right away so then a big investigation with local police and fbi got involved and then there wasn't really much of a clue until something unrelated to that crime for the most part happened three weeks later a guy had called in and said that he had a frozen body in his freezer his friend margarine had asked him to put it there and so that's kind of what opens the pandora box of like questioning them and looking into their friends and things and then it started to slowly uncover more and so i'm here just outside eyeglass world this is where uh, he unfortunately lost his life the cops had pulled in i imagine they went off the main road and I think he was just on this little uh, side road here. Yeah, because I don't think he was in the parking lot. 
So it must have been around here. Yeah, pretty crazy, man. So he, it's unclear if he was involved or not, uh, but if he didn't know it was real, it's like, ooh, that's gotta be a big bummer. So anyway, I'll go now to where he was, he got the bomb collar basically, which is also next to where this guy, Bill Rothstein lived. And he's the guy who had the body in his freezer. So here on the right is where Bill Rothstein lived and down that path in front of me is where the TV tower is, where they placed a bomb collar on Brian Wells. So afterwards, the police investigated the area because they knew where he went to deliver the pizza. And they looked around, they could see all of the footprints on the ground, and they could see there was a sign of a struggle. So later on, when people are thinking about if Brian Wells was involved, like why would there be a big sign of a struggle? So I'll go into a little bit more of that at the end. But anyway, all of that went down just, you know, quarter mile up that path. And then right there, as I mentioned, was Bill Rothstein's house. And so now we'll go into the two of the bigger players in this story. One of them's Marjorie Dell Armstrong, and the other one is Bill Rothstein. So Marjorie and Bill knew each other since the late 60s. So they knew each other 35 years or so. And he even had a thing for her way back in the day. And they dated a bit, but they were never married or anything. But it seems like he always had a thing for her, which is evident if he was willing to put a dead person in his freezer. So we know that there's something going on there. But they were both smart. Marjorie got a BA and a master's in education, uh, but obviously has some screws loose. And I'm not sure if he actually ended up finishing college or a lot of things in general, but he's definitely came from a good family and everything like that. So anyway, while the police are investigating the Brian Wells case, they get a call three weeks after it happens. And that's when Bill Rothstein mentioned he's got a dead body in his freezer. And he tells them that Marjorie Dell Armstrong killed this guy, you know, over some fight. And so the guy who was killed names James Roden, and he had been dating Marjorie for about 10 years. They were off and on, you know, they loved each other, then they hated each other, like, you know, many relationships. And so she ended up killing him with a shotgun. And she called up Bill and said, she's got to get rid of this body. He offered to help. She gave him $2,000, then they melted down the shotgun afterwards. And he actually, which fairly enough, was worried about jail. I mean, possibly about the Brian Wells case, but about having a dead person in your freezer. He wrote a suicide note right after he called the police. And so the police came and checked not only his house, but her house too. And they're huge hoarders, so the place is just a complete mess. And they also saw that he, he had written this suicide note, and there's a few things he put on there. And the very first thing he said is that, this has nothing to do with the Brian Wells case. And so it's like, oh, okay, really? <laughs> so to me, that's not the brightest thing in the world to say. They're both arrested and he ends up getting out on bail and he never really goes to prison because he actually ends up dying about a year later of cancer. And then she goes into jail, she doesn't get out. Eventually on those charges, she gets like seven to 20 years and then while the time she's in jail, they're, they're deep into the pizza heist case and she ends up getting convicted for that later. And this isn't the first time Marjorie's had issues with guys before. She had a couple guys in the 80s or 90s that she dated. And the first really big case in the mid 80s was that she had shot a guy who was basically sleeping six times. And she said it was because she was afraid of abuse. And so she killed him while he was sleeping. And so this was a huge case in Erie, Pennsylvania at that time. So she was on law enforcement's radars for, you know, decades, basically. And then later in the 90s or a few years after that, she had another guy she was dating or married to that went to the hospital and died because he apparently fell and hit his head on a table or something. And so you've got two people who had already died that she dated and this was the third one so obviously there's something going on there so as i mentioned she goes to jail she had pleaded guilty to third degree murder and some other things and actually at first she didn't say anything about the pizza heist thing but like more information was coming out and she basically blames it on bill and that didn't really matter much because as i mentioned he had already died after about a year so it's always easy to implicate someone who's dead right but she had said it was because he was in love with her and he wanted to kill James Roden because it was like a jealous thing. 
And then later she also blames them for the pizza heist thing. And meanwhile, there's investigations going on in the case and it's on TV several times on different programs. So other people come forward and mention certain things like the pizza call was actually made from a payphone at a gas station. And some people had seen Bill and Marjorie making that call at that time. And then there's other reports that see Marjorie and like Bill driving around that area when this was all going down. Of course, she said it was a coincidence. She was just shopping, but it's pretty obvious that uh, they have some involvement. So what was the motive of all this? Was it just for the $250,000 from the bank, which they didn't get? <laughs> the guy only got 8,000. And that's actually not directly what they wanted. Marjorie knew that her father had a lot of money, or he at least did back in the day. And I'm not sure if she knew she wasn't on the inheritance. Like her dad knew she was a whack job, so she wasn't on the inheritance, but she wanted to get that money. And so she actually wanted to hire a hitman to kill her father to get the inheritance. And so she knew this guy, Kenneth Barnes, who was a crack dealer, and he agreed to do it, but he said it was for $250,000. So the pizza heist wasn't just for her to get the money, it was for her to get the money to pay off the hitman. And so Kenneth Barnes was already in jail for drug charges, and he took a plea deal to testify against Marjorie for what happened. And he tells most of the story for a plea deal. And that pretty much seals the fate for Marjorie. She ends up getting life in prison. And then there was a couple other people involved. There was this other guy, Floyd Stockton, who was actually Bill's roommate at the time. And he was also there at the TV tower and helped them put the collar on. I think he was the main one that actually did it. And then they also found some things later in Bill Rothstein's house that indicated he was probably the one that made the bomb collar. He was definitely brighter than the other people, so he probably was the one that did that, especially because he was willing to take a dead body into his home, so he would be willing to make a bomb collar for Marjorie for this heist. So this guy Floyd, who put the collar around his neck, was actually already in jail for like having sex with a mentally disabled woman in Washington. So he was already in jail too, and he was gonna testify, but he had a stroke at that time. And so the connection between Brian Wells and the rest of them is through a prostitute named Jessica Hoopsick. And Brian was one of her customers, and she knew Ken Barnes because that was her crack dealer. And Ken Barnes had asked her, she's like, do you know any guy who's not the brightest person in the world who might be able to be a fall guy in this case? And she's like, I know this really nice guy who's a pushover. Maybe you could use him for this pizza heist. And so that's kind of the full circle of all of these people that were involved. There was one other weird thing with this case. The other pizza guy at Mamma Mia's named Robert Panetti was the only other delivery driver besides Brian Wells. I guess they're about the same age or so. And the police were gonna go and question him, just see what he knew, because they worked together. And he died like the day he was supposed to go in for the interview. Like he died of an overdose, basically three days after the whole event. So that was also another like kind of unusual thing about this case. So one of the big questions in this case isn't who did it. They know it was Marjorie, who was the main person and Bill Rothstein was definitely involved too. But it's if Brian Wells had any involvement or not. There was some witnesses who said he knew something about a bank robbery and that prostitute that he went to mentioned the opposite, that he was not aware of anything. So there's basically conflicting information there. Was this guy totally taken advantage of? Absolutely. Like there's no way he would have gone out there knowing there was a bomb that would detonate within 55 minutes. And what was the motive for killing Brian Wells? Well, of course, if he got caught, which he of course did, he initially said it was three black guys robbed him. But if he was gonna look at serious time, he was obviously gonna tell the police who made him do that and they would have gotten busted for it. So he was set out to die that day. He probably was aware of something going on, but not to this extent. And he definitely doesn't seem like the brightest dude in the world. I mean, he is like mid forties delivering pizzas. He's obviously not making a ton of money. So if someone offered him, you know, a big amount of money to do something that wasn't so horrible, it's, it, I mean, it's possible, but he was completely taken advantage. And so a pretty tragic case. And so I'll give you my final thoughts on this case. 
It really isn't much different than any other true crime case. Almost all of them are about love or money, <laughs> pretty much. And if they didn't have this crazy bomb collar and scavenger hunt with the pizza guy, it would have been just like any other case where someone's hired to kill a relative or someone for insurance money, basically, or an inheritance. And although it seems sophisticated to make this bomb and the scavenger hunt, it really wasn't. The bomb was actually pretty easy to make. I mean, it's, this stuff definitely took some creativity, but it wasn't super hard to make the bomb. And although that scavenger hunt slash ransom note was nine pages long, and it has all these details of, you know, the police shouldn't be called and all these things and places to go. There was nothing intelligent about that either because after he robbed the bank, they should have had him go like five or 10 miles away <laughs> and then gone somewhere else. And quite frankly, I mean, they could have even just had him leave immediately and go somewhere where they could hand it off where the police couldn't drive and follow them. Like let's say in the woods and then it connects to a road or you drop it into a boat over a bridge and they took off, take off in a boat or whatever. But the fact that they has, have his first stop within, you know, a one minute drive of the bank is not very bright, obviously. And then the fact that they had him deliver a pizza at the end of a road, which is adjacent to one of the main guys in the case house. And then he tells the police that he has a body in his freezer, which is right next to where Brian Wells was supposed to deliver that pizza. Obviously not the brightest in the world. <laughs> So anyway, it's a funny case. It's definitely cool to look into, but there's no uh, geniuses in this case for sure. And also the fact that she would pay someone a crazy amount of money, $250,000, and they had to get it from a bank. They don't even know if they could get that money because getting the money from the bank isn't easy. So I'm not surprised that he's only able to get eight grand. And then she's hoping that her dad dies and she's gonna get a bunch of money, but. He, they had already known that he was giving most of that away. So she might have only gotten a few thousand dollars from that anyway, or like maybe like 50 or 100 grand, but it might have not even been more than the bank. So definitely not the brightest people in the world. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed the video. Like and subscribe if you did, and I'll see you guys next time. Take care.